If you like the work I do and you want to see me continue to do it, you can support me in a few ways. First, you can check out my Patreon. That's probably the best way. Second, you can check out my Teespring. I sell shirts and stickers and mugs and all kinds of other things on there. You can also check out my other YouTube channels. I have a retro game channel where I talk about subjects like why does Shy Guy have a mask and why are CRT TVs the best way to play retro games. And finally, I have a game store where I sell controller, cartridge, and game box stands for every system from the original Nintendo and Sega Game Gear to the Xbox One and Nintendo Switch. So give that a look too. Okay, let's get into it. I found an interesting article earlier. It's titled, YouTube sued for $720,000 over alleged copyright strike retaliation, quote unquote. So I figured we'd take a look at this article, see what it has to say. DJ Shorty, a popular YouTuber who claims to have earned $310,000 dollars from the platform is now suing the company. The case is extremely unusual and centered around claims that YouTube not only failed to promote his videos, but also retaliated to the threat of a lawsuit by not processing copyright claims properly, resulting in his channels getting shut down for repeat infringement. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me at all, honestly. It says... It's centered around claims that YouTube not only failed to promote his videos. That, that part is really, really important. That's basically provable in many cases. They failed to promote videos that they don't like or, or anything critical of them, they won't promote it. Or they'll stop promoting the channel completely, that kind of thing. While most YouTuber, I'm sorry, while most YouTube users are simply visitors to the site, a minority produce their own content and upload it to the platform for others to enjoy. Some can make a decent living when they enter a revenue sharing agreement with YouTube, but when things go wrong, those earnings can stop in an instant. According to popular YouTuber DJ Shorty, real name Eric Mishiev, this happened to him, and he's blaming the whole thing on YouTube using copyright strikes as retaliation to his threats of a lawsuit. In a complaint filed in a California federal court Wednesday, Mishiev describes himself as a well-known journalist and DJ known as Shorty, who publishes original music, DJ mixes, and celebrity interviews in videos on YouTube. Since 2007, Mishiev says he's run two YouTube channels, DJ Shorty Forever and The Shorty Show. These channels were monetized following an agreement with YouTube, and after developing a subscriber base of 250,000 users, his channels generated more than 110 million views. For this, YouTube paid him $310,000 over a five-year period. That sounds about right. I think that's probably pretty accurate, give or take. In March 2016, Mishiev claims he began receiving copyright claims on his highest advertisement revenue videos. He says he responded with counterclaims to avoid YouTube's three strikes process, which would have disabled his channel. However, he reports that all claims were won and his channel was reinstated for monetization. Really fascinating. I know YouTube is honestly kind of a crooked company at this point. Like they will deprioritize your video. They will take monetization away for any reason or no reason at all. They will do all kinds of really, really crooked things. It's pretty messed up. And I've been trying to separate my income from YouTube's AdSense. And I've largely been successful in that attempt. Trying to separate the two things has been difficult, but doable. And, and, I, and I'm succeeding. So I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. Lots of support from Patreon. Lots of support from all kinds of other avenues. So I, if YouTube disappeared tomorrow, like if YouTube deleted my channel tomorrow, all, all of my channels, I would be okay. I'd, I'd be fine. Just making it off of the various different revenue sources that I have coming in. I'd make significantly less money than I do, but I would survive and I could continue building an audience outside of YouTube. So I'm really not terribly worried about what YouTube does, but it's just like on a more personal note, it's really disappointing to me that like to see YouTube go from where they were to where they are now, they were something special. They were huge. They had so much going for them, like YouTube did as a company. And they got a little trigger happy and a, and a little scared and buckled. And not just once, not just twice, not just three times, but at least a minimum of four. We've seen a minimum of four adpocalypses or adpocali or whatever you want to call it. It's YouTube has implemented rules as a result that are really... Okay, so let me give you an example of a rule that I don't like with YouTube. 
the start of YouTube's downfall, in my opinion, is when they decided that you couldn't monetize a channel until you get a thousand subscribers and 240,000 watch minutes. It's such a small thing. Like, you're not going to make a hundred dollars before that point. Like, I, you may make a hundred dollars before that point, before you get a, a thousand subscribers, but that's it. It's really not that much, honestly. And it took me like a year to get to that point, to a thousand subscribers. But it discourages people from trying. They can sit there and watch their analytics and watch their numbers go up. They can sit there and watch their revenue come in, no matter how small an amount it is. And it encourages them. It gets them excited. They want to take part in this because they can see, visually see money coming in, even if it's a small amount. And it keeps them going. And YouTube pulls that away from them from smaller creators, and it, it's discouraging. That discourages people. Not just that, but my podcast channel, my old one, I reached the threshold for monetization within, it, it took me like six or eight months to reach it or something like that. It was in October, and I applied for monetization for partnership, and it just got monetized um, like a month ago or something for the very first time. So it took them like 10 months to monetize my channel or something like that. So you've got a year of waiting to reach the threshold and another year of waiting before you see a dime. Like it's just, they're discouraging people from even bothering. Now there are a lot of really solid, good content creators on here right now on YouTube. Lots of really good creators. That's not gonna be the case for long. In fact, pretty soon, all of the content creators that are here now that are really good are going to move on with their lives and go off and do something different uh, or just lose interest in the subjects they're talking about. And there isn't going to be anybody there to replace them because people were discouraged in the beginning from even taking part. So just like I I'm going to be fine no matter what happens with YouTube. You YouTube could disappear tomorrow and I'd be OK because I have Patreon and all of these other sources of income. But just on a personal note, it's really sad to see YouTube turning into a shell of what it once was and not being able to stop it from happening. It's, it's just really, really sad because this place has been the source of a lot of enjoyment and joy for me. But anyway, that's all I really wanted to say about YouTube. It's just sad to see. And like I said, they are kind of a crooked company. Like they retaliate against people in a number of different ways through yanking monetization or not giving it to them in the first place through retaliation with content id strikes or copyright strikes or whatever they can do to fuck somebody over they do it if you say something critical about youtube then they will ruin you and it's sad that they have that kind of power and they don't have any competition either on this note, I wanted to talk about YouTube's competition because people keep saying like, why can't you just start a competing company? Why can't you just start a, a, you know, or move over to a different platform, the equivalent of YouTube? Here's the problem with it. YouTube is owned by one of the biggest companies in the world. The, it's on the cutting edge of artificial intelligence development. And they have unlimited servers at their disposal unlimited bandwidth. They run the internet in many places. Google does. I mean, they are the ISP. They own phone companies and everything. They're massive. And it's taken them decades to build up to the point that they're at now. When you're streaming something like I'm doing now, like just even when it's not streaming, even when it's just regular video form, most of the views that, that, that what I'm saying right now are going to get are going to be in normal video form. People are going to go to the podcast channel, click on it. When you click on a video like that, it's not a broadcast like a TV. It's not just feeding a signal and whoever wants to tap into that signal can. It is sending that data stream to each individual person. So it's not a broadcast, it's a stream. And that is that's very relevant because you have to have really powerful servers that are capable of sending a video stream to a thousand people or 10,000 people, which is really common. Like David Pakman, I think he's around 800,000 subscribers or something like that. Or even Kyle Kalinske, he's at like 500,000. When they live stream, they get tens of thousands of people. 
Do you know how powerful the servers have to be to handle a load of 10,000 people just for one YouTube channel streaming on one day? Just one video. It has to be absurdly powerful. BitChute could not handle the types of... the. It couldn't handle the user base that YouTube has. It couldn't. Daily Motion could not handle the user base that YouTube has. Even if we convinced people to go to those platforms for one reason or another, they couldn't handle it. It's too much. It's too powerful. So YouTube cannot be usurped. They are at the top and they are not going anywhere until they crash. And I honestly don't think that YouTube is ever going to crash. They've just not completely. They're becoming a shell of their former selves, but they have you they have Google backing them. They will always exist in one form or another, I think. They may replace the CEO at some point because she's making a lot of bad decisions that's that's going to crumble the company and youtube itself as a company hasn't been um, financially productive uh in years they've been in the negatives for years they've been youtube's been paying money out to exist for years so anyway i don't know it's just disappointing to see youtube going the direction they're going it's not about like concern for myself or anything so much as sadness that a great platform is eating itself from the inside out. So a lot of people have probably come here looking for for an explanation for the thumbnail for the title of this video, which is, is Trump connected to Scientology? It's not clickbait, I promise. You guys may have heard of Leah Remini. Leah Remini, she was on the TV show King of Queens. She's actually, I would I'd call her a, a B-list celebrity. She's pretty big. She's been in some big stuff. And she created this TV show on A&E called Scientology and the Aftermath, I think. She used to be a Scientologist. She left the religion and, or if you'd call it a religion, I would debate that. But anyway, she left the group and she created a TV show on A&E all about how messed up Scientology is. And I think that's really fantastic. That's absolutely amazing. Well, she recently, I just found this article that says, it's called, um, Leah Remini calls out Trump administration's ties to Scientologists. This is a picture of Leah Remini, by the way. This is on the website that I was, I was um, reading from. So let's give this article a read and see what it has to say. For years, Leah Remini has listened to the horror stories of people who've escaped the clutches of Scientology, and she has had it. What I, this is a quote, what I care about is justice for the victims of Scientology, the actress and whistleblower tells me. We need to start raiding Scientology's folders and we need to start taking action. Enough of the Twitter bullshit. Now it's time to get serious. On August 26th, A&E will air the final episode of the Emmy-winning series Leah Remini, Scientology and the Aftermath. It's a two-hour special focusing on the rape allegations against actor and Scientologist's uh, Danny Masterson, and features two of that 70s show star's accusers telling all to ex-Scientologist Remini and Mike Rinder. The episode was supposed to air in February, but was put on hold by the network following an elaborate smear campaign conducted by the Church of Scientology. Recently, four of Masterson's sexual assault accusers have filed a civil suit against Masterson, the Church of Scientology, and its leader, David Miscavige, alleging stalking, physical invasion of privacy, and a conspiracy to obstruct justice, according to reporter Yashar Ali. Masterson has called the suit beyond ridiculous. Of course he has. Scientology is famous for this, honestly. They're famous for being aggressive and vicious and take no prisoners. It's called fair game, the fair game doctrine. If somebody is against your group for any reason at all or no reason, you can, you're justified in doing absolutely anything, whatever it takes to bring them down, whatever it takes. This goes on to say, it's important that people hear what goes on in Scientology when a crime is committed and how the victims are blamed for what happens to them, says Remini. That's Scientology technology to say, when you've raped somebody in a former life or what have you done to receive that? It's never, wow, you've been raped or molested. We need to contact the police. You're not allowed to report crimes outside of Scientology. If you do, you're labeled an enemy and they'll come after you and try to destroy your life. Sounds a lot like Jehovah's Witnesses and the Catholic Church and Mormons. Well, the Catholic Church to a more limited extent. The Church of Scientology issued a rambling statement to the Daily Beast branding Remini 
dangerously unhinged as they've done in the past. Yeah, they tend to do that. I'd love to see what they said. It continues on to say, in a wide-ranging conversation with the Daily Beast, Remini opened up about the end of Scientology in the aftermath, her frustration over shelved episodes, and what's next in her quest to expose an organization she calls a dangerous cult that's hurting people. Then they said, we've reported on this a bit as well, but there's this weird trend of people with strong ties to Scientology getting very close to members of the Trump administration. Then Leah responds, very close? Very close? No, no close. Close, babe. Close. Donald Trump has tweeted about Scientologist singer Joy Villa, a person who's infiltrated the White House. Yes. Then they said, there's also Greg Mitchell, a lobbyist who's done a lot of work for the Church of Scientology, who met with Vice President Mike Pence. And there were two big Scientology donors in Jim Bridgeforth and Tom Cummins of America, Power and Gas, who recently met and posed for pictures with President Trump. She said, yep, they should do some research. There's a policy in Scientology dealing with the public image. This is also under the fair game stuff, and it's to infiltrate real churches, control governments, control government agencies. This is all part of the policy of Scientology, which is to infiltrate to take over. They have no idea what they're dealing with, and I'm disappointed that they're not seeing through Joy Villa's bullshit. You only need to look at her social media to see whose political side she was on before. She wears that Trump dress, and then she gets her failing career going. This is all part of the game of Scientology. Scientology hopes to take over our government. The interviewer asked, you also have people out there like Greta Van uh, Sustern. I don't think a lot of people know that she's a high-ranking Scientologist, and she's out there conducting sit-down interviews with President Trump and other high-ranking officials in his administration. Leah said, big time. She's a big-time donor to Scientology, and she's OT8. Holy hell. That's the top of the the Scientology bridge. Do you know how much it costs to get that high? That's nuts. That is crazy. OT8. That is as high as you can get. You cannot be higher. That's like the same level that the owner is at. That's like the level that David Miscavige is at. That is absolutely nuts. I had no idea that that was the case. So the point is that Scientology is is actively attempting to infiltrate the White House, the government. That does not surprise me at all. Are they going to be successful? Well, they've been plenty successful in getting celebrities to join Scientology to an alarming extent. And there are actually, they are, they have been successful. There are people surrounded with, like, people who have surrounded Trump who are Scientologists. That is their stated goal. So it's pretty concerning. It's something that we should be aware of. So first up from Maddox Starpunch, uh, I've been going through your podcasts and heard you're progressive on LGBT rights. I have a question. Have you heard of plurality? It's a new movement centering around alters, basically additional personalities in one skull that aren't harming. How do you feel about that? Very interesting. Um, I am very LGBT affirming, or I... I try to be as affirming and positive as I possibly can. As far as pluralities go, that sounds like dissociative identity disorder or multiple personality disorder. I'm not super clear on it because this is one of the first times that I'm hearing of it. I think I've heard of it one other time and I didn't really put much thought into it. But I I would not include them in the LGBT community, I don't think. Maybe that's the wrong thing. And if it is, maybe I just need to do a little bit of research on it and find out. Either way, I support everybody. Absolutely everybody. I mean, I, you say it's non-harming. I am 100% in support of you and, uh, and of your journey and what you're going through and what it takes for you to feel comfortable in your own skin. I believe that that's the absolute least that I can do is have respect for you and your struggles and experiences and life. And I would expect the same from everybody else. Just be respectful of me and my experiences in life and and we'll go from there. So I don't know. Uh, I don't know enough about it. I'd need to read more about it. But just right out of the gate, I am in support of you as a person. So there you go. Gabe was asking, where's the beef? Seriously, though, what's uh, what's your favorite painting or artist if you can't choose one? Oh, okay. I love art and 
paintings and and all kinds of other things of various sorts. But I'll tell you this. This is my obligatory mention of Tool this week. I love the band. They just released a new album, so I have to mention them. And you know what? I'll give you a little bit of a sneak peek on one of my upcoming videos. I was debating whether or not to do this. Tool is a... I I will get to your question. I am going to answer it, but there's a little bit of lead up first, so let me get there. Tool has been one of my favorite bands for like a really, really long time, like decades, basically. And they... um, that a lot of their lyrics are really deep, right? And that's what I really appreciate about them. Their lyrics are really deep, and their guitar riffs are just spot on. So I was going through their old catalog again recently since they released that new album, and I discovered... Well, I've known this for a while, but it reminded me that they're a very religious band. Not Christian, but kind of Eastern mysticism religious And that bothered me a little bit because they're always talking about chakras and just all kinds of stuff that really bothers me. So spirits and and all this stuff. And their new album had a song on there that talks all about spirits. And it's just it, it really bothered me. So I decided to make a video recently debunking tools lyrics where they talk about religious stuff in it. I've already written the script, recorded it and edited the voice. Haven't finished the video itself yet, but it's getting there. And I wasn't really sure if I should release it or not. I've decided that I think I probably am going to release the video, but it's basically just pulling apart their lyrics and talking about why it's nonsense and how disappointed I am in the bands that they do that. But I I really do still love the band. It's still a phenomenal band. Anyway, to answer the question, the question was, who's my favorite artist? At this moment, I have a lot of favorite artists and a lot of reasons for that. I really like Picasso. Van Gogh was an amazing artist and lots. My least favorite artist, I will tell you, is Jackson Pollock. I think he sucked. Now, he had some good stuff, but that abstract art stuff bothers me. But my favorite artist at this immediate moment is the artist for Tool. His name is Alex Gray. This is another thing that really bothers me about Alex Gray, about the band Tool. So Alex Gray's been with Tool for like, since almost since the beginning, not since the very beginning, but for a while. And he believes that he's like a shaman who takes hallucinogenics and goes to a higher plane of existence when he does. And the people there tell him and show him what to paint. And then he paints it, and they slap it on a Tool album, and they sell it for millions. And that just, like, that bothers me so much, man. Like, there's so much pseudoscience behind this. But it's such good artwork. Like, look at some of this. Seriously, look at this. This is from a painting called Seven Faces, I think. Yeah, okay, this is Seven Faces. This is the the Seven Faces, the original Seven Faces painting right here. Really, really beautiful. I, I think it's a painting. Anyways, really beautiful piece of art. The guy is just, I don't even have words. He's so good. I mean, look at, look at some of this. I know that the people on the podcast are probably going to be bored to tears by this, but he's got a thing with eyes that's just absolutely amazing to me. Like, he's so good at, at his art. It's just mind-blowing. You can, like, dissect this stuff for hours. So he's my favorite artist at this immediate moment, but that, that, that changes from time to time. If you guys have never seen Alex Gray's artwork then you should really go take a look trigor was asking in your opinion what do you think would happen to the state if a person of a cultish religion like jehovah's witnesses or mormonism gains presidency well i recently saw a video of tom cruise where he was saying he was running for president turns out it's a parody so don't don't get all excited about that that would be a disaster if a cult member became president or got into any real power I would just really hope that the protections in place would pr- would protect us from them. Like the protections that are built into the Constitution and things like that. The, the limits on their power. But honestly, I thought that that was going to be the case with Trump, that there were going to be protections in place. But like him or hate him, Trump, that is, he's done some things that have done nothing but benefited Christian extremists, and I was really hoping that the protections would be in place to prevent Trump from doing something really, really dramatic 
that that's super unconstitutional or really, really wrong, just plain morally wrong. But it feels like those protections have not really been there or haven't really worked one way or another. So I'd be really, really concerned if a cult member became president or got into a position of real power or something. That'd be very concerning to me. From Omega Riley, what's your favorite kind of soda? I like root beer a lot, but I've been trying really hard to not drink soda. I've been trying to drink water and only water, but sometimes I drink orange juice. I do like orange juice pretty well. Soda is very, like, bad for you in many ways. It's just sugar water. You're just destroying your teeth and your insides, really, when you think about it. Before I move on, I want to check the Super Chats because somebody mentioned that and I didn't realize that I had so many, so that's pretty amazing. Let's go back and check those. Kep1134 says, love your videos. Okay, thank you, Fork. That's awesome. I appreciate that. Uh, Omega Riley, I love your videos more than Fork. That's a tall claim, but you know what, Fork? Omega Riley is my biggest fan, so you're going to have to fight him for that. Then Linky Mew says, love your vids more than Fork and Riley. Wow. Okay. And then Omega Riley. No, they don't. These are all super chats, by the way. Thank you guys so much. That is amazing. That's seriously amazing. Uh, and then the doctor. Omega, Fork, and Linky Mew got no game. Also, here's enough for Terraria. Oh, you're trying to get me to play Terraria. Okay. And then Omega Riley. But wait, I bought him Terraria already. He just needs to add me on Steam. Oh, did you really? Okay. Well, shoot. Maybe you'll have to play it then. Uh, let's see. Yeah, that's all the super chats. Thank you guys so much. That is amazing. I really appreciate that. From Fork. Has Telltale had any luck with his cat pissing everywhere? Have I had any luck with my cat pissing everywhere? Yes, actually. He hasn't done it lately. I cleaned his litter box. I haven't taken him to the vet yet because I just wanted to try a couple of things and see if it worked. Now, I did. I had just changed his litter box recently, but I cleaned it up the other night again. And I paid a little bit more attention to him that day because... I thought maybe I just wasn't paying any attention to him or maybe I wasn't paying enough attention. So I like picked him up and put him in my lap and he just sat there while I worked all day and pet him and was nice to him and everything. And I left a big old heap of clothes on the floor. Usually I put him in a basket in the bathroom before I take him to the laundry. I took the clothes out of the basket and put them on the floor next to my desk and just let him sit there for two days to see if he would piss on them and he did not so i think i'm in good shape i think i'm okay we'll see i actually i picked the clothes up now maybe i should put them back down there again and see if he continues to but yeah it seems okay so far so we'll see what's your advice to give to lgbtq youth more specifically if the youth is in an unsupportive religious family that's a really really tough situation and I'll give you the same advice that I give somebody who's trapped in a cult and doesn't know what to do about it. I would say you need to bide your time and prepare to leave when you can. When it's legal and safe to go, prepare for that time. There will come a time when you're you're able to leave and be out on your own and safe and it's going to take a lot of work and preparation, so start working on it. And in the meantime, you can maybe try some deprogramming techniques, some subtle deprogramming techniques like street epistemology, trying to get your parents to open up a little bit to it. If it's safe, don't do this if you worry about what their reaction would be or something because you don't want to like really ruin things for yourself. You have to be really, really careful sometimes. Some people have to be really careful, so only do it if you feel comfortable doing it, but you could maybe try gently, carefully, you know, nudging your parents in the right direction, that kind of thing, if it's a safe thing for you to do at that moment. The last question that I answered was about being in an unsupportive family. And actually, I, I, I saw somebody who was watching the podcast live say, I'm a trans man and my parents don't support me and I don't know how long I can last. On that note, I want to mention that you should talk to people in the community here who are going through it now too. It's extremely important. And I wanted to read this, this one last article that I had here. It's not really an article. It's a Reddit post. It's titled, I'm a Jehovah's Witness and I need help. 
I'm currently on a public library computer using free Wi-Fi because my rich, stingy parents haven't bought me a device of my own. This is my only escape to the outside world. I come from one of those conservative Jehovah's Witness families where if you're not reading the Bible, you're perusing the Watchtower magazine, praying or witnessing to annoying the hell out of the neighborhood. I feel like I'm an outcast in prison. We don't have internet, no TV, no cell phone. My mom won't even let me check the letterbox in case there's something explicit in there. I'm forced to attend meetings I don't like. I'm forced to pray to a being who I don't think exists. I'm smart, but I'm not allowed to study for school because that's evil, transient things of this world. Why don't I leave? I'm 16. A lanky, bull-cut teenager cannot face the world alone with no money. Why don't I leave when I get to 18? I've seen what happens to a close friend. Her family disowned her. Her other friends acted like she didn't exist. I tried to keep contact, but if I show my sympathy with her, I'll be severely punished. She tried to get jobs, but it's hard with no experience or life skills. What do I do? How do I break free? This is my exact experience. This is the exact thing that I experienced when I was that age. Well, really between like 12 and 16 is when I experienced it. This exact thing. Like I wasn't allowed to communicate with the outside world. Wasn't allowed on the internet for a while. Wasn't allowed anything. Anything at all. Nothing. It was like a prison. It was, it was like a prison. It was like isolation. It was isolation. It was like solitary confinement for years. It will fuck you up. So I definitely relate with this person. There's an update here. It says, my Wi-Fi is about to terminate, so I'll have to come back tomorrow if I can. And then it says, update. My free internet finished when I had one comment and four upvotes. I have to admit, when I logged back in tonight... I got a little overwhelmed at the response. The librarian asked me if I was okay. Like you guys advised, I told him what was going on and he's promised to try and help while warning he's not sure what he can legally do if it's without parental permission. Here's my plan and it's kind of a compilation of all your ideas. I'm going to read up on personal image, employable characteristics, do some extra reading for school. I'm homeschooled. That's my exact story. I was too. So hopefully a university or employer will accept me at some point. I have a dream of becoming a psychologist so I can help deal with people's personal issues, which is naturally something I have great sympathy for. Might do some research on that as well. The only problem is I don't get much free time, about an hour at the start of the day and maybe an hour at the end. This is when my parents are off doing something, not sure what, and they dump me at the library with the latest watchtower. The librarian is going to talk to my parents about getting a small job I can do at the library. Cleaning, stacking, moving books, maybe even some desk work. Over time, I should be able to accrue some funds. Not sure where I'll keep them yet. It's going to be a steep climb, but you guys have inspired me to start the journey. And for that, I could not be more grateful. This is seriously just my exact story. Let's look at some of the responses here. Ex Jehovah's Witness here. I have a lot of sympathy for what you're going through. As bad as your situation is, what you have going for you is that you've decided to get out young. The best thing you can do right now is set yourself up for success, for your future life free from the cult. It's coming up quickly. You're apparently still in school. Hopefully you aren't homeschooled, which he is. He did mention that. Your parents most likely are strongly against higher education. Ignore that. Start preparing for college. Talk to school counselors, your teachers, whoever you can, to help you get into college, hopefully with a lot of financial aid. The resources are out there. Tell them about your situation. Education professionals will not be sympathetic to parents that actively discourage education. Make them your allies. Do not tell your parents about your college plans until you absolutely have to. Of course, none of this applies if your parents are actually pro-college, as I understand some Jehovah's Witnesses actually are now. If you can't take it anymore, then do, do as others have suggested and try to get child services involved as others have suggested. I don't have any experience with that. That's up to you to decide if that's a step you need to take. Uh, I second the XJW subreddit as a great supportive resource. 
you didn't say where you were located, but on the odd chance that you happened to be in Central Texas and want to meet up with some sympathetic XJWs, I'd be happy to introduce you. If you're not, then the folks at XJW subreddit can probably help you meet some others that have been through what you're going through in your area. Above all, try to stay positive. This part of your life will be over soon. There's a whole big, exciting life waiting for you after you get out. Start preparing now. So that's it. This is the saddest shit ever. I dealt with this exact thing. I really wanted to start a non-profit charity at one point, and I have like the mission statement and goals and everything all written up already that would help people like him, like this exact situation, figure out how to get into college, get financial aid for it, get them a cell phone, because this kid doesn't have one, so that they can stay in communication with friends, so that they can make friends, so they can use social media to build a support network, because that's the very last thing that Jehovah's Witnesses want, is for you to have an outside support network, so that when they pull the rug out from under you, they can be sure that you fall flat on your face. I, I still have that goal, but it's going to be a while before I can actually act on it. It's a lot of work, it's a lot of money, and it's a lot of time. I can just move on it slowly, that's the best I can do, but... I really hope this kid gets help because I can definitely relate with this deeply. That's all I've got for you tonight. I appreciate you guys coming and giving this a listen, and I will talk to you guys next week. If you like what I do and you want to make sure I can continue to do it, you can support me in a few ways. First, you can support me on Patreon. That's probably the best way. But if you want to get something back for your support, you can check out my Teespring. I'm trying to make a shirt design for every cult I've covered. I haven't gotten every one, but I'm working on it. So check it out and see if your cult is up there. Second, you can support me by checking out my game shop. I sell controller, cartridge, and game box stands for every system from the original Nintendo and Sega Game Gear to the Xbox One and Nintendo Switch. So give that a look too. And finally, if you want to support me in some way other than monetarily, you can check out my other YouTube channels. I have a retro game channel where I answer questions like, why does Shy Guy have a mask? And why are CRT TVs the best way to play retro games? I also have the podcast where I talk about stuff I don't feel I can say on a monetized channel. And finally, I have my main channel, where I talk about cults. I wish I didn't have to worry about dancing around subjects carefully in the first place, but I chose to do this as a full-time job, so unfortunately, I rely on YouTube's AdSense and on the support of patrons to continue doing the work I do. Anyways, check me out in all those places if you haven't already. Thanks for listening, guys.